All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, State of the School and happy uh, homecoming to everybody. Um, see more people who are faculty members here than I expected, so uh, it's just, just as well my slides are totally consistent with those presented at the last faculty meeting. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's get it underway. And um, uh, once again, I uh, want to start off by acknowledging what uh, all of you know is a very important event in the, the life of uh, the school, and that is the uh, uh, fantastic, uh, generous gift that we've received from uh, Patty and Alan Herbert uh, that has uh, renamed our school as the University of Miami Patty and Alan Herbert uh, Business School. So I think an important issue just to think about for a moment is uh, what, is the, what does the gift uh, mean? Um, so I would answer that in three respects. One, it means that there is a very firm found financial foundation on which the school can now um, extend to the next level. Uh, I would say that the commitment that has been given is a necessary but not sufficient commitment to catapult the school to next level of excellence. And let me just context that by saying that when uh, the University of Chicago Business School sold its name, if I can use the word sell, which is a little bit of a crass term, but when the University of Chicago was named, it was named uh, the Booth School for a gift of 300 million, uh, and Booth subsequently injected another 100. So although this is a really fantastic um, gift from our point of view, needs to be put in context of what other uh, significant gifts have been made to other schools. But obviously, it gives us a very firm foundation on which to build. It's a fantastic vote of confidence. Um, the second thing that I think is important outside of this uh, room and outside of our school is the fact that there are seven other schools that are in the University of Miami that are unnamed. And these schools just went up in value, um, if I can put it that way. In other words, this gift has set a benchmark, set a, set a mark uh, to market, if you will, for other schools within our university. And so um, all of the other students at the other institutions should benefit over time from this, uh, from this uh, donation to us. Uh, and then thirdly, I think um, it's worth reflecting on uh, the importance of the gift in the context of uh, Miami um, higher education. Um, you know, one thing I noticed when I came down here from the Northeast was that uh, the, uh, the level of commitment to philanthropy on behalf of higher education is uh, lower here than it is in the North. Um, and, you know, that's a reflection of uh, institutions in the Northeast being 400 years old as opposed to less than 100 years old. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm hopeful that um, FIU and uh, Miami-Dade College will also benefit uh, from this uh, exceptional uh, statement on behalf of higher education in uh, South Florida. So with that, with that as a backdrop, um, you know, I like to uh, show this, this particular slide because it, it sort of underscores uh, what, we, what we see and what we do uh, in this kind of an institution. So everything, of course, depends on <coughs> having the best and brightest students that we can possibly um, attract and retain. Uh, and in my experience, if you have really good students, you're going to attract and retain really good faculty. If you have unmotivated and poor quality students, you won't be able to get that quality of faculty. Um, so very good students, attract very good faculty, uh, and then once the faculty uh, teaching those students, the students themselves will attract uh, very good recruiters, and the recruiters will uh, hopefully give fantastic jobs, uh, dream jobs to uh, the students who graduate, and those uh, uh, recruiters will then uh, uh, transform the students uh, into successful alumni give them the opportunity to transform themselves into successful alumni who then become supporters, who then fund the next uh, 
investment in scholarships and faculty uh, for the next generation. And it's kind of instructive that Patty and Alan Herbert were um, students here in the 1950s. They both uh, are graduates of Miami uh, Herbert Business School. And, um, you know, it's a 50-year journey, 50-plus um, year journey that's resulted in this major gift to, uh, to our school. And, um, you know, that's a reflection of this cycle. And, you know, sometimes when I talk about the importance of this gift, you know, I, I ask people in the audience to reflect on the fact that they, in the 1950s when they were students here, had no doubt some dedicated and highly motivating and fantastic teachers um, whose names are probably long forgotten, uh, but in a way their legacy, the teacher's legacy, is in the gift that 50 years later came to the school. So it's, it's a journey. It's a very long lifetime journey of commitment that um, is celebrated in this particular gift. Uh, but what it means is um, investment, more investment in uh, students, uh, facilitating more investment in student scholarships, but I think equally, if not more important, in the facilities that make up the student experience. So I think that um, in some ways the, the weak spot here is not so much in the, in the scholarship support level, though that's always something that we can benefit from increasing, uh, but it's also in uh, the facilities. Uh, we have, as you may know, uh, two-thirds of our undergraduate courses are taught outside of the business school uh, in general purpose classrooms because there just is no longer space in the business school for those courses to be held here. So that really inhibits a level of camaraderie that we would like to develop among the, uh, the undergraduate population uh, in our business school, and it's important that there be, uh, at some point, new facilities, a new building that enables uh, um, that uh, business school activity to all take place within the business school and to, to build that sense of uh, community. Um, We'll also be obviously invest investing uh, further in faculty and enhancing research in developing and supporting uh, new innovative programs. So in many in, on many dimensions, the gift is gonna be a very helpful contributor to uh, advancing the, the mission and the uh, vision of the school. So it's always important, I think, that we, uh, on these occasions, you know, reflect on what the, the mission and the vision happen to be. Um, and the mission is um, pretty succinct, and I think every word is pretty important in the, in the mission statement. It's uh, emphasis on innovation, it's emphasis on principled leadership, uh, it's emphasis on transformation, uh, emphasis on globalization, and the fact that uh, society is mentioned as well as business. and. Uh, that's in a sense a, ref a very valuable uh, endorsement or reflection of the uh, Business Roundtable recent uh, uh, recycling of the uh, purpose of a corporation, which some of you may have picked up on a few weeks ago in the media, where um, the major corporate CEOs of the United States uh, uh, agreed to a new statement as to what the purpose of a corporation is, which. Uh, turned out to be very much more of a stakeholder statement uh, than a focus on shareholders as the uh, principal driver of uh, business responsibility. Um, so business is now responsible uh, explicitly, as stated by the CEOs of uh, the top corporations of our country, uh, to consumers, to employees, to suppliers, uh, and uh, to communities, as well as to uh, shareholders. Um, I think one key uh, element of the vision statement that's important is the uh, emphasis on the word sustainable prosperity. Uh, as many of you will know, we have launched an MS in sustainable business uh, this year. Uh, 24 students from 11 countries. We're extremely excited by the quality of the students who have joined that program. And I think that uh, it's a real differentiator for our school. Um, but also, in addition, 
not just the program itself, but what we find is there are many people who look at our other programs, our MBA programs, our MS programs. They want to do those programs at a school which values uh, sustainability and uh, uh, those kinds of concerns that uh, particularly Generation Z students uh, bring to the table. So even if they're not interested necessarily in the MS in sustainable business, they'd still like to do the MS in finance or the MBA at a school where an MS in sustainable business is on offer. And our faculty developed around about 10 new courses for this new degree program, and those courses are available to be taken by students in all of the other degree programs. So it's something for everybody. It's not just for the 24 students who happen to be taking that particular degree. Um, last year, our faculty uh, decided uh, to, uh, uh, actually a committee of our faculty decided uh, over the summer months in a series of meetings and it was endorsed uh, by our school council, um, decided on what interdisciplinary priorities we wanted to uh, focus on. And uh, there were five areas that we uh, elected to concentrate on in terms of our research and programmatic activity. I call them horizontals because they're interdisciplinary, they cut across marketing and finance and uh, operations management and so on. And so one is leadership and governance, the second is, uh, should be global strategy and operations, sorry. Uh, third, business analytics and technology. Fourthly, behavioral decision making. And fifthly, uh, sustainable business. And the first of these leverage uh, territory that our faculty are already highly competent in. Uh, and then we've got a couple like sustainable business where we're aspiring to be uh, on the cutting edge of innovation and uh, catapult ourselves into a leadership role. Then there are also some vertical areas, in other words, vertical industry sectors, which historically have been very important to uh, South Florida and to our school. And those would be, uh, in particular, healthcare and real estate. And entrepreneurship could go really in a vertical or in a horizontal, depending upon your mood. Uh, but entrepreneurship is something that we've been really emphasizing heavily over the past couple of years, um, consistent, I think, with the, uh, the lifestyle and the attitudes and the uh, objectives of the South Florida economy, which is obviously historically and continues to be a very important entrepreneurial uh, location in our country. And then finally, our finance faculty, very interested in possibly doing something a little bit more focused in uh, the wealth management area. And again, I would highlight the fact that uh, this is an area where clearly a lot of money is moving into Florida from the Northeast. Um, by the week, we hear of new folks showing up from New Jersey and Connecticut. Uh, they may be tax refugees for 186 days a year. Uh, but they're still moving their businesses and their orientation into uh, South Florida. And a lot of those asset managers are going to need people to help them and hopefully find them in our, in our school in terms of the uh, students we're offering to the market. Uh, in terms of uh, who we are, there are a total of around about 158 uh, faculty uh, in our school, uh, approximately uh, 90 of those faculty are tenure or tenure track faculty, and then the remaining faculty are a combination of clinical professors, lecturers, adjunct faculty. And you can see uh, on the right hand side the uh, uh, percentage breakdown. So obviously, international includes many people who are US citizens, but their country of origin uh, is outside of the US, and so they're included in uh, the international statistic. Um, just to uh, highlight a few of our uh, new faculty, always like to, to do this because we're very proud of the uh, faculty we're able to attract to our school. Uh, might just uh, single out uh, one person uh, since we actually have the live, the live uh, version uh, here in the room. Uh, 
I, th I think that might be the, the chap two down in the middle column, um, just, just based on the uh, facial hair. Um, so th this is uh, Dr. Ola Hendrickson, who uh, has come to us from the University of Warwick Business School in the UK. Um, thanks to Brexit, he is uh, excitedly uh, with his family leaving the UK as fast as possible to uh, come to safer territory. <laughs> oh my goodness, okay, that's terrible. You should have, uh, well, maybe, may, maybe it'll be okay. Um, so let, let, let me just uh, highlight that uh, Ola, which, which journal is it that you're an associate editor of? So information systems research. Why do I mention that? Because we have three new full professors this year. Uh, Lan Wang, who came to us from Minnesota in management science. Uh, she is an associate uh, editor of the uh, Journal of the American Statistical Association, the leading journal in that field. And then we have uh, uh, also Dr. Yoncha Ermitur, who is a professor in accounting and she's a uh, area editor for management science, which is a leading uh, academic journal as well. My point is that we're increasingly attracting some of the top professors from uh, other universities who uh, are leaders in their scholarly journals and uh, they're coming with that expertise and uh, capability uh, to our classrooms. Uh, the other person I just want to, without uh, underrating or understating any of the other people on the, uh, on the chart, but um, Alex Niemeyer, who is not in the room, uh, he's a very interesting uh, attract, uh, addition to our faculty because he was previously the head of supply chain management practice for McKinsey worldwide. And he was based in, he's based in Miami sick of traveling uh, for McKinsey all over the world and so decided to uh, uh, retire from McKinsey and now is with us full time. And it's really fantastic that we're able to bring on board not only leading scholars but also someone like uh, Dr. Niemeyer uh, who I think, although he's been a consultant with McKinsey, graduated with a doctorate in nuclear physics um, and, you know, there's not every business school needs a doctorate in nuclear physics, I can assure you. Um, so we, we've just got a great group of faculty and uh, it's wonderful that they're with us um, and joining us in, uh, in, in droves. Um, so what do we do here? It's, it's actually useful just to kind of summarize perhaps for you. We're, we're producing around about 600 undergraduates per year to the marketplace. Um, to the uh, economy. Uh, there are 2,400 roughly in the school. Anne Olazaba will talk a little bit more about that. And then there are about 600 postgraduates with master's degrees who are uh, graduating each year and joining the economy. So around about 1,200 individuals a year are graduating with degrees from the school. Um, in terms of rev revenues, the bulk of our revenues are coming from graduate business programs and undergraduate activity. So the undergraduates uh, uh, are covered by an allocation that we receive for teaching all of these undergraduates from the University of Miami. The graduate school revenues are revenues that we largely uh, obtain and retain for ourselves. So we have more control, if you like, over our own destiny when it comes to the graduate degree programs than undergraduate, but the undergraduate programs are hugely important here, uh, not only because they're a quarter, roughly, of the total University of Miami student uh, majors, but in addition to that, many of our undergraduates continue through to our graduate school, so we have around about 100 plus students per year who graduate with an undergraduate degree but continue into our graduate degree programs. And obviously we know those students very well, we know the quality of those students, we've already trained them, and so that's an enormous asset to our graduate program activity that we can um, 
rely on our undergraduate student body to be such a good source of, uh, of uh, students for our master's programs. Then we have uh, uh, some increasing activity in non-degree executive education. Uh, a couple of years ago, this would have shown up as 0%. Uh, it's now 3%. We serve some very important companies uh, with uh, specialty programs such as Bacardi, uh, Visa, Telemundo, uh, to name a few. And then finally, um, all of the endowment that we already have for the school, as well as uh, annual giving from our supporters, um, tends collectively to result in uh, or account for about 7 to 8 percent of the total revenues of the institution each year. So that's a little bit about uh, the, uh, the finances uh, in relationship to uh, what we actually do. And now I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Vice Dean Patricia Abril, who is the uh, Vice Dean in charge of all of our graduate programs. She'll make a few comments. And then uh, Professor Ola Zabel, uh, Vice Dean for undergraduate education, will talk about uh, the undergraduate area after that. two-year MBAs are. Uh, now, many of you may have been reading in the press that, uh, you know, the MBA is uh, facing a difficult market globally, that people are opting for shorter programs or opting for uh, becoming entrepreneurs or challenging the ROI. Um, luckily, we in Miami have not seen the downturn in the MBA market that other schools have seen. Um, our MBA remains strong and vibrant, and we are doing everything possible, um, the faculty, the staff, everything possible to make sure that it continues so. Um, so what are we doing? What are we doing to make sure that our MBA continues to be healthy despite what other um, actually amazing schools, even aspirational schools, um, have suffered? Well, one of the things that we're doing is that back in April, the faculty launched an MBA redesign of the curriculum. Um, to, to date, and now it's, we're almost uh, seven or eight months down the road, probably about a third of our faculty have engaged in, in a lot of work and discussions, benchmarking, innovation around what the MBA of 2025 should look like? What should we be teaching our students? We've gone out and we have talked to probably over 60 companies, uh, recruiters, we've talked to alums. If any alums are in the room, I'm happy to uh, later take um, more, uh, more feedback. Um, and we've asked the question of what are the critical skills that we need to be engendering in our MBA students or across programs. And so one of them that has continuously come up is the ability to be creative and the ability to be resilient in changing times, um, using data to make decisions, uh, working in leader, uh, working as a leader and in teams. And so based on those three themes, the faculty have come up with a very innovative new curriculum that we hope to launch next year. The other feature of that program that is really unique to any business school um, that we know of or that we've we've been able to unearth, if you will, is that all of the classes have a significant component of project-based learning. This is not, no one learns how to be a, a CEO with a multiple choice test. 
And I think that we all, uh, faculty, students, all agree to that. So we have uh, reduced or eliminated the multiple choice tests, reduced the, the degree of lectures. Um, we have really excited students to put the learning into their own hands and created project courses and created other experiences for the students to really get their hands dirty before they go out in the market. And we're really proud of that. So what why do I mean growth? Um, the, over the past five years, graduate business programs has grown dramatically. We have uh, sunsetted programs. We have started many programs. We have started online uh, programs. Um, and so here you see, um, if you look here to, to, the <coughs> to your right, um, where we've been over the past five years in terms of new student enrollments. These are the students coming to campus every August that we are welcoming with open arms. Uh, we have grown dramatically. Just from last year to this year, we've grown 14.5%. Um, and these are mostly fueled by our specialized master's programs. What happened in 2015, 2014, is that the school um, then very wisely invested in creating a series, a suite of specialized master's programs that have really ver been very appealing in, um, very appealing to both recruiters and students. Why? Because students are confident that they learn a specialized skill set. They're 10 months. They have all of many of the components of, uh, of a longer program, and students feel very equipped to go into the market. So um, I'm very proud to say also that this year we have our highest number of women in the graduate business programs. We have 49%. Um, that's really high. Um, usually, uh, graduate business programs nationally and internationally are at the about 40% mark, and some schools are really proud of that. And so, imagine. Pff. Um, and then our international students. Our international students have also grown. We've seen a lot of interest in our programs from China, especially. Um, Latin America as well continues to be strong. After all, we are Miami. Um, so we have an extremely diverse student body. Um, and uh, we are very proud of that. And then finally, our programs. We have about 22 different graduate business programs. And it's hard to classify them. Um, and so when people ask me, they're like all my children. I love them all the same. But for you to understand how, you know, b basically what the market is doing in each of them and, and how to think about them, we've classified them <coughs> in three rough categories. Um, <coughs> the first one here being uh, programs that um, due to market conditions and you know where we are today are expanding very rapidly. Um, our MS in finance went from about 60 people last year to over 200 this year uh, without sacrificing quality. I, I'll, I'll add to that. Our business analytics was a step ahead. The year before, they went from about 57 to over 100, and they continue to be strong, and every year are getting much, much more stringent in admission criteria. Um, our pa what we call our pathway programs, our 4.5 our our 4 programs. These are programs, the dean mentioned that we have a lot of programs that go directly from undergrad and um, into grad by uh, borrowing credits. Um, and these are very interesting programs to undergrads, especially who want to go to our pre-experience master's programs. So they are growing as well. And as well as our, executive, our accelerated MBA in real estate. Again, we're in Miami. Uh, we are a real estate town, and so this is, this is one of those programs that is also attracting a lot of, of new attention. In terms of new programs, these are programs that we have created within the past two years. The dean mentioned the MS in Sustainable Business that is really more than just a program 
but has, as he said, it's become kind of an identity for, for the school and has attracted a lot of very interesting people from all over the world that probably would have never found us or even thought about Miami in that way. Um, the one MBA, and I'll just mention that the ones that I have stars next to are our high, en high end, and what I mean by high end is, is, is that they're C-suite level students in the classroom. Um, that's, those are the ones that are starred there. The one MBA is a program that's 20 years old, and it is in a, run by a consortium of five leading business schools. One in China, called Shaman, Brazil, FGV, Mexico, EGADE, and the Netherlands, um, Erasmus. We were chosen last year in, in a uh, competitive, let's say, beauty contest to be the North America partner, the US partner for this program. We are incredibly proud of it. It basically recruits um, C-suite level executives and they come to their courses here, but four times a year they go all over to these partner schools to have week-long residencies in country. So it's a very, very exciting program and has also put us on the map because it really also has brought us together in a really meaningful uh, kind of MOU consortium type relationship with other top business schools in the world for the first time. Um, our accelerated MBA is also uh, very, uh, very new. This is our one-year MBA that has, uh, we took away the summer and has become even more accelerated. This is a, this is an intense program that is a boot camp style MBA for those that are so inclined. And uh, we have great students there that are doing program, um, projects now for Royal Caribbean and are being uh, really challenged by executives at Royal Caribbean and, and succeeding at that. And then I, I'm gonna call them our flagship programs. These are programs that are well established, that we are very excited about, that have the best curriculum as well. Our Master of Accounting, Taxation, Health Administration, the uh, Academic Director Carolyn Mortensen sitting right here, um, International Business, and of course, leadership. Um, leadership is one of our most uh, exciting also programs. Many uh, faculty and, uh, sorry, many staff um, all over the, the university have come through this program and we're very proud to say that it's also growing. And then finally, the last three, our Global Executive MBA, our Executive MBA in Health Administration, and our Professional MBA. I will point out that this past year, our executive MBA in health administration was number one, number one, in the rankings among all executive MBAs in health. We are very proud of it. It is not a new program. It is 40 years old, and it is one of our kind of most tried and true programs that we are most proud of. Steve Ullman is sitting right here. He is the, he is the mastermind and the guru behind that program, which uh, also gets the highest ratings from its students. So thank you very much. I will be happy to take questions at the end, and I'll be happy to talk to anyone who wants to give me feedback on a new MBA. Thank you very much. For those of you I don't know, I know quite a few people in the room, but if you don't know me, I'm Ann Olazabel. I'm the Vice Dean for Undergraduate Business. Um, I have just a little update for you on where we are with undergraduate, and if you haven't been here in a number of years, um, I think you'll be surprised to see that we've made huge leaps in quality in our program. So it, this is the uh, admissions profile for this year's incoming class as compared with last year's incoming class, and yes, that is an SAT of 1347. So for those of you who were from 10 or 20 years ago when I first started teaching here, you will probably be thinking, good God, I wouldn't get in now. <laughs> and that is true. It is incredibly competitive. In fact, we led the field of undergraduate schools and colleges with respect to admission rate as low as 25% now for the School of Business. So 
that is a serious leap for us as a school and really uh, tells us that our quality um, and our, the quality of our teaching and the quality of the student experience is being recognized by the marketplace. So lots and lots of students wanting to come here. Um, the rest has re remained relatively steady. I th we intentionally decreased our class size to the extent that we had any control over admissions because we don't make those decisions here, but we had been imploring them for several years to sort of cut off the tail and make sure that our students were of even high quality, and so could we you know, bring in a few fewer students so that we could retain that quality. So very pleased to see that our incoming class actually shrunk just a little bit. We'd like it to stay right around 500 if we could. So we'll see what happens next year. Evidently, for those of you who don't know, we had 39,000 applications for the undergraduate class of 2,100 students across the university, not just for business school, but 39,000 applications for a student body being selected of 2,100 students. And at this point in time, all also different from um, when you were here because it changes every year and our percentage keeps going up. So unless you're here now, you were not in an environment where the business school was more than a quarter of the size of the entire student body. Um, we used to be much smaller as compared in particular to the College of Arts and Sciences. And so as is a trend all over the country, business for uh, at least a decade or two has been the most popular undergraduate uh, major. And um, at this institution, we are suffering, I should say, um, in the College of Arts and Sciences from the same sort of trend that the rest of the, the nation is seeing, and that is that fewer and fewer students are choosing uh, to, do, do, to do their undergraduate study in the humanities and in the arts. Um, while the STEM programs are still strong at the College of Arts and Sciences, we are seeing the same sort of um, uh, a shrinkage of students who are interested in studying the humanities and arts um, that other schools are seeing. And so I don't know if many of those are now flipping over to business, but certainly that makes a lot more space for us here in the business school. Um, and so as the dean said earlier, we need another building. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot more students. And by the way, um, we have a, we have a uh, total, as the dean said, of tw about 2,400. It's 2,441 um, the last time I looked, which was, I think, last week. Um, here in the business school, all told, this shows you just our freshman entering class. Um, if we have 2,441 students uh, doing business degrees, some of them are doing more than one major. So they're concentrating more and more of their work here in the business school. And then we also have, depending on the semester, anywhere between 900 and 1,200 students from other parts of the university studying and completing a complete business minor here at the school. So they're doing a marketing minor, or they're doing a finance minor, or they're doing an entrepreneurship minor. So we have a lot of students studying business topics. It's not just the 2,441 that are full-time degree-seeking students. So there's a lot going on. It's very exciting. So the other side of my, um, of my slide is really about curricular innovation. So if you haven't been here, if you weren't here this year or last year, all of this will be very new for you. So I think for everyone who's not a faculty or staff member in the, in the room, this, this will sound new. We have a brand new degree. So we've been many, many years, at least 15 years, with our BBA and our BSBA, the B Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. And just this, this past year, we established a brand new degree called a Bachelor of Science in Accounting and Finance. And it is geared directly for students who want to go into corporate finance or who want to go into accounting but know that they want to understand finance really well or want to go into finance and understand that they really need the accounting background. So this is an exciting new program. We launched it, we, we got Board of Trustees approval in April, I believe, and over the summer, without ever having met them, we were able to recruit 31 freshmen into this program by just asking them whether they were interested in this. And if, as you may know, finance is a very popular uh, major. Accounting is also a very popular major. And so students were induced to think about this major not making a commitment, but just starting down the path to doing something that they see as valuable in the marketplace. So we're pretty excited that without a whole lot of hullabaloo and zero marketing dollars, we were able to get 31 students into this program, which is a really nice number because we can put them through as a cohort. So we'll see what happens next summer. Uh, let's see, new majors, brand new majors. Um, we had already 14 majors, so now we've got some new things for students to think about. Um, an exciting new major in organizational leadership out of our management department so that students can begin to think about what it means to be a leader and learn the theory even before they get out there in the world and practice it as leaders, because it may take them some time to get a high level management position, but certainly having that grounding in people and 
courses like Leading with Empathy, for example, so important in today's day and age. So we're really excited to have this new offering. We also have something that um, a lot of the world has been asking for. Globalization is one thing, but what does it really mean to be an international business person or a global business person? And what the recruiters are telling us is they need to know something about the world not just about the way business attacks the world, right? And so this is a place where we have established a program that's quite unique in that most of the coursework for the major is taken outside the School of Business. So students are encouraged to go out and pick a region or a country of the world and learn about it. Do their study abroad there, learn about the economics, learn about the history, learn about the society, et cetera, so that they have a very deep understanding and language facility as well um, so that they can go out and actually be an internationalist or be a global citizen and then also have their business major along with that. So this is also brand new. And for our BBA students, we also developed a business, or should we, the management science department did, so credit to them, um, developed a, a, a major in business analytics for that degree. It had heretofore been reserved only for students doing the Bachelor of Science in Business. Um, and lastly, we have two new minors. Really excited about these because these are interdisciplinary and they are fresh, they are current topics that the market is really dying for and that our students are interested in. So we have a brand new, as, the, as of the end of last uh, semester, we have a, a minor in FinTech and a minor in Sustainable Business. And the Sustainable Business minor mirrors sort of the concept behind the master's program, which is that it also needs to be interdisciplinary and take advantage of coursework in other parts of the university. Why not take a course at the Marine School? Why not take a course in the Ecosystem Science and Policy Center here in the College of Arts and Sciences? So students are encouraged to do that, to learn about the, the environmental problems that we face, about the justice problems that we face, about the policy problems that we face and then figure out ways that business can be part of the solution, right? So pretty excited about that. Those are programs that the students are just now beginning to elect. They're available to our current students. They're available to new freshmen. Um, so we shall see how those grow. Um, many, many new courses, as you can imagine. In particular, I want to call out the marketing department. I'm not sure who I see who's here from the mar marketing department, but they have developed a suite of excellent new and innovative courses for their major, things like brand storytelling, things like AI in marketing, um, very, very new and innovative and interesting, and our students are pretty excited about that. So. Um, I can't list them all, but there are tons and tons of new courses and things that are no longer fun or, f or fresh or rele as relevant as other things are being put on the shelf. And that's renewal. It's important that we innovate and it's important that we prepare our students as best we can for um, what's coming. So uh, it's quite a job staying on top of the curriculum. Um, I could go on for quite a while with another whole slide on what's going on in the student experience, um, but I'm guessing some of you want to get out there and, and dig into the shorties and dig into the, um, the salty donuts. If you haven't had those before, I could smell them when I came out of my office. They're amazing. Um, so I'm not sure what comes up next, but I'm going to turn over the mic um, and thank you very much. I'll be outside too if anyone wants to chat and give me feedback about anything that's going on in the undergraduate program or learn more about what we're doing here. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, just a few uh, final uh, thoughts. You know, one of the things that um, I are, I'm often asked by alumni is, well, how can we actually uh, help? And I think um, there are many, many ways in which our alumni are helping us every day that, you know, go well beyond uh, writing a check. So I want to go through those first. Um, because they're very important. So the most important thing that any alumnus can do is to recommend our programs to someone who they believe would be qualified to be an alum as well. Um, you know, the alumni are the owners of the brand. Um, the faculty don't own the brand unless they're alumni. We're, we're the stewards of the brand, if you like, but we're not the owners. The owners are the people who carry uh, the name of the school on their CVs for their whole life. So you alumni are the people who are our best resource in terms of uh, volunteering and suggesting and nominating and cajoling uh, friends or sons and daughters of friends to think about uh, coming to this school or at least to have them look at all of the options that we have on offer, which are really, uh, it's an astounding, uh, portfolio of good stuff that uh, is available here. 
So that's number one. Then number two, we have a lot of students who are very keen to have uh, mentors. Um, and so we do actually have a very active and I think uh, well-established mentor, mentee program that is run out of our career services uh, department. Um, and uh, probably around about 200 uh, students at the moment uh, are being mentored by someone. Uh, many of those people, probably the vast majority, are alumni. Uh, then thirdly, um, as we've heard, experiential learning is more and more important in our curricula. Uh, students are very interested in that. Recruiters will often ask students when they're being interviewed, you know, talk to me about a project that you've done, talk to me about a problem that you've uh, wrestled with and solved. And so, uh, you know, one story in this regard, because uh, I see uh, Dan Hicks here, who is part of our faculty in the sustainable business area, but remember I mentioned those 24 students. Um, Dan uh, managed to secure for those 24 students capstone project opportunities at Office Depot, and when he went uh, up to Office Depot to talk about the opportunities that were available, um, I think uh, the, the CEO of Office Depot, uh, Jerry Smith, said, I'll take all 24. Uh, so problem solved, a single company took all 24, the entire class of uh, students in this new degree program, uh, such as the interest in that uh, area. Um, so it's not just uh, capstone projects. Many of our students are seeking internships, uh, not the traditional internship alone between the first and second year of an MBA program, but also many students uh, take internships now after they graduate from a 10-month master's program. Uh, they'll take a three-year internship in the summer following graduation Hopefully, many of those internships uh, extend into full-time employment opportunities, uh, but that's a way for the student or the recent graduate as well as the recruiter to get a mutual look-see at each other to see if they want to get uh, uh, married, as, as it were, for the longer term. Um, fourthly, I would say very importantly, um, when I came here, I was amazed to find there was no corporate partnership program. Um, no real organized outreach to uh, corporations. Uh, so in the last year and a half, we have, uh, uh, we have now added 63 corporations uh, to our partnership program. And collectively, uh, all of these together deliver probably over a million dollars in free cash flow a year uh, to the school. And uh, Roni Shear, who you know, does a lot of things, including organizing homecoming, but Roni is also the uh, architect uh, and steward of the uh, partnership program and has really been uh, fantastic in building that. Uh, and then for finally, uh, you know, come to a distinguished leader lecture. Um, I've just put up here a couple of uh, ones that we have coming up shortly. If you're interested, on November the 12th, we have uh, two remarkably successful business women, ex-CEOs, who are now um, conducting their career mainly in the boardrooms of public companies. They're going to be talking about uh, opportunities for women to serve on boards. Uh, and then uh, uh, I'm pleased to say on December the 12th that we have uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, Robert Schiller from Yale University, who's going to be here talking about uh, um, the economy and uh, his real estate index, the Schiller Index, which is a very well-known benchmark for uh, economic health. So please come, sorry, it's November, the th uh, December the 13th. So please come and uh, uh, make sure that you uh, take advantage of these extraordinary uh, opportunities. A lot of people now are calling us saying, we'd like to come and give a lecture uh, as part of this series. Uh, when we first started this two years ago, I had to basically beg, steal, and borrow from my own Rolodex, uh, but now people are calling us saying, when can we come and speak? Uh, finally, I want to introduce Casey Supple, because Casey uh, is our uh, Director of uh, Alumni Relations and Development. She came to us from 
Columbia University around about a year and a bit ago. And uh, we have, as part of the uh, um, Patty and Alan Herbert uh, gift, a challenge that Patty and Alan have uh, established. And I want Casey to just briefly describe what that is. So uh, just uh, go ahead, uh, if you would. Thanks. Hi, it's good to be with everybody this evening. Um, the intent, intention of Patty and Alan's gift was really to be the starting line and not a finish line for us in fundraising. So they actually set aside a portion of their whole gift to match other gifts from people, our graduates, our alumni, our constituents, um, up to specified amounts to our strategic areas like scholarship, faculty, facilities, and participation. And participation is really critical for us. So our first public challenge is the Alumni Participation Challenge. So all gifts from our alumni that are made to the Business School Unrestricted Fund will be matched dollar for dollar up to $100,000. The challenge started on October 15th when we announced the naming of the school and it will conclude either when we reach the $100,000 mark or on December 31st. So if you so feel inspired, you can even text your gift. Um, you can text Herbert to the number on the screen and you can make your gift today, or you can make it up until the end of the year. All right, thanks very much. Can, can we in, increase that to 200,000 or is that not allowed? Do we have any okay. takers? All right, um, anyway, uh, thanks very much indeed. I just. Uh, wanted to end with one, you know, slightly um, out of order mention, but, you know, we haven't uh, talked very much about our non-academic staff here uh, this afternoon, but we, we really do have a uh, fantastic, hardworking and dedicated team of non-academic staff members. And um, a portion of these uh, folks uh, were uh, challenged by me around about a year plus ago uh, with respect to LWED certification. So I was thinking to myself, my goodness, you know, it's going to be very embarrassing to be starting this MS in sustainable business and find that, you know, our own practices within our own buildings are not uh, consistent with sustainability. So you probably think of uh, LWED or LEED certification as applying to uh, new buildings, but actually. They also have an operations and maintenance uh, certification that applies to existing buildings. Uh, so with the help of uh, many people in the university, uh, it became a really fantastic university-wide effort to uh, get all of our buildings here, including the one we're in right now, uh, certified as uh, lead gold for operations and maintenance. Uh, this. Uh, made us the first academic building in Florida uh, to be certified in this, uh, in this manner. And uh, it's really just a tremendous compliment to uh, all of the folks uh, here in IT and uh, uh, janitorial folks and uh, facilities folks uh, at our school uh, who uh, really committed an enormous amount of time uh, to the application process and the certification process. So we're very proud of our faculty, but we're also very proud of our non-academic staff as well. Um, I want to just uh, introduce one person who uh, is new to our school, relatively speaking, who's Mindy Schuster, who uh, Mindy is the Director of Finance and Administration at the school. She came to us recently from the Cogod School at American University in Washington. and. Um, you know, it's really uh, just uh, fantastic uh, support to the uh, financial integrity of our institution. So I want to make sure that everybody here uh, doesn't uh, have to linger too much longer in terms of, um, as uh, Anne said, not uh, availing themselves of the uh, food and beverage opportunities outside. But let me, let me just see if there are any questions for either myself or for any of the uh, vice deans or senior staff here before we uh, finish. Yes, sir. If you do the behavioral decision making, what is actually, what is that going to be? That is way above my pay grade, so uh, someone help me out quickly, okay? It's a cluster, it's not a group. Okay, it, can you explain what a cluster is? Okay, so uh, a, a recent cluster is. Um, you have the, who has the mic? not 
Um, this is not a degree. This is a research cluster. So the clusters are an effort to basically take different um, intellectual and academic areas around the university, and sorry, around the school, and instead of siloing them in departments, to get people uh, really working interdisciplinarily. So behavioral decision making is the field that studies how our implicit biases in our behavior can influence our behavior. Um, and so, of course, that affects marketing, and that affects finance, and that affects ethics, and that affects so many other areas. So instead of calling it one thing, we get all of the f interested faculty that are interested in that topic together, and we call it a cluster. <laughs> okay, could never, could never have done it. Um, but actually, the point is, um, marketing consumer behavior were very strong finance behavioral finance which is essentially investor behavior were very strong management organization behavior were very strong so the idea of these research uh, horizontals is you take people from each of the departmental silos and you put them together and mix the uh, brew and you i'm sure will agree it's pretty well documented that the best creative thinking comes at the edges of disciplines. So the interdisciplinary uh, mix is very important to the generation of new ideas uh, in our context as well as in uh, many other fields of endeavor, including the sciences. So that's the, the idea. Yes, sir. Sorry, J just hold on. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the idea behind that is to, you know, set a goal that is aspirational, but at the same time achievable. Uh, so we're talking in terms of trying to take the uh, business school ranking to within the top 25 by the year 2025, which gives us around about a, a six-year runway uh, remaining to adjust the uh, programs, uh, improve the uh, faculty research output, uh, as well as uh, uh, attract better and brighter students through the, uh, the brand name recognition being elevated as well. I think the gift is very important in that regard because we're getting a lot of visibility and publicity just from the gift alone. And you know, faculty and students and constituents, all everybody wants to support a winner Everybody wants to support an institution that has momentum. And obviously, the more support that we receive, the more we can do in terms of investment, as I said, in the student experience, the faculty, and facilities to drive us towards that, uh, that end point. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, so thank you again for coming. And uh, this is the price you have to pay before you can enjoy yourselves. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.